Welcome to the second part of the Tree Biology Energy Balance Lecture. In this lecture, we'll focus on what attributes of leaves and canopies influence the size or the magnitude of the radiation inputs and outputs. One of the main reasons we're interested in studying the energy balance of leaves is because we're interested in understanding how leaf temperature will vary in certain situations. This equation is a simplification of the energy balance of a leaf that helps us to understand the main controls over leaf energy balance. I have expressed leaf temperature as something relative to air temperature because that's what we're really interested in is how high above air temperature does leaf temperature get in any particular situation. So the leaf minus air temperature is proportional to, is, you can think of this almost as an equal sign, is proportional to the boundary layer resistance of the leaf multiplied by the net radiation minus latent heat loss. Net radiation just refers to the net amount of radiation absorbed by a leaf. So as you can see here, net radiation is a complicated term because it basically includes all of those short wave radiation inputs and outputs and long wave radiation inputs and outputs. So here we have short wave radiation absorbed, which is a function of incoming short wave radiation multiplied by the short wave absorption coefficient, the short wave radiation reflected from the leaf, and then the long wave radiation absorbed and reflected from the leaf, as well as long wave radiation re-radiated from the leaf. The sum of these inputs and outputs is the net amount of radiation absorbed by the leaf. So what you can see is that all other things being equal, if net radiation increases, if the amount of radiation absorbed by the leaf increases, that means this number will increase. So the leaf will get warmer relative to air temperature. Similarly, if the boundary layer resistance increases, all other things being equal, leaf temperature will get warmer relative to air temperature because boundary layer resistance is the controller of convective heat loss. So you can see that basically what we have here is the main energy input to the leaf and then the main methods of energy dissipation. Boundary layer resistance, which controls convective heat loss, and L or latent heat loss. So what are some leaf attributes which modify these different energy balance components? We're going to talk about that for a few minutes. There are some attributes of leaves which can modify how much radiation is reflected from a leaf. So things like trichomes or leaf hairs on leaves as well as cuticular waxes can both act to greatly increase the amount of radiation that's reflected from a leaf. So in this case, this ceanothus leaf has both white wax as well as lots of trichomes, and you can see that the leaf looks white. That leaf is going to reflect a lot of shortwave radiation, so it will have a relatively high reflection coefficient. Another important comp uh, attribute of leaves which affects their energy balance is the leaf angle. As we know, leaves can be displayed at different angles relative to vertical. So we can have relatively acute or more vertical leaves. We can have horizontally held leaves and leaves that are intermediate. These influence how much radiation is absorbed by the leaf. So if we think of radiation coming directly from above, indicated by those red arrows, what you can see is that the more acute leaf angle, because it's exposing basically less surface to the sky, will absorb less radiation. At the opposite extreme, 
an exactly horizontal leaf will absorb much more radiation than the acute leaf. So leaf angle is an attribute that affects how much radiation can be absorbed by a leaf. When you think about it, leaf wilting is actually an adaptive trait that enables leaves to become more acute, but instead of sticking up, they wilt down, and that reduces the amount of radiation absorbed by a wilting leaf, which could be a last-ditch uh, mechanism to reduce desiccation in wilting leaves. But leaves also, even when they're not wilting, will display at different angles depending on where they are in the canopy and, and other attributes. There are other attributes of leaves which modify the boundary layer and therefore the convective heat loss. Leaf morphology can affect boundary layer resistance. So recall boundary layer resistance is controlled by leaf size. So leaves that are bigger will tend to have larger or higher boundary layer resistance because there's a larger distance over which the boundary layer can develop. Interestingly, in many trees, shade leaves tend to be larger than sun leaves. And it's thought that one reason for this is that shade sun leaves are smaller and in this case have much deeper lobes because that enables them to have thinner boundary layers or lower boundary layer resistance and therefore more efficient convective heat loss. So it's been argued that this sunleaf morphology is partially an adaptation to more efficiently convect radiation away from those sun leaves, which are absorbing lots of radiation high in the canopy. Other factors, like needle leaves versus broad leaves, influence boundary layer. Obviously, needles are very small, pine needles, and therefore they will have very low boundary layer resistance and therefore very efficient convective heat loss. Factors like leaf hairs or trichomes can also modify the leaf boundary layer and therefore how efficient or inefficiently heat is lost through convection. So let's think about these different properties of broad leaves and needle leaves and how they affect the dissipation of energy from those leaves. And I've, I've indicated that as different ways to skin the energy balance cat. If you can think about it, when we talked about leaves reaching 100 degrees Celsius in full sunlight if they don't dissipate energy, clearly energy dissipation is important. But different types of leaves dissipate energy in different ways. So that energy dissipation cat can be um, skinned in different ways. So let's compare broad leaves and needle leaves. Now obviously broad leaves tend to be big, needle leaves tend to be small. That therefore influences their boundary layer resistance. Broad leaves tend to have a higher boundary layer resistance than needle leaf trees. Because boundary layer resistance controls convective heat loss, that means convective heat loss from broad leaves tends to be smaller than needle leaves. So convective heat loss is more important for needle leaf trees in general. On the other hand, stomatal resistance, in a general sense, this is not always the case, but in general, broad leaf trees tend to have more wide open stomata or a lower stomatal resistance than do needle leaf trees. What that means is that broadleaf trees, because of their smaller stomatal resistance, will tend to more readily lose water and therefore have greater latent heat loss than needle leaf trees. So what you can see is that the convective versus latent heat dissipation components are different in broad leaves and needle leaves, but in the end those combine to both effectively control the temperature of both broad leaves and needle leaves. So let's move up in scale and think about forest canopies and what factors are important for controlling the energy balance of entire forests. 
Obviously we have energy inputs to forests and we're essentially talking about the same concepts as we talk about when we talk about leaves. Short wave radiation and long wave radiation. The same thing is true with energy dissipation. We still have reflection from canopies, uh, and long wave re-radiation and so on. But there are a couple of additional considerations that we need to think about when we think about entire forest canopies. One of those is soil heat flux. Soil heat flux just absorb, refers to energy absorbed by the soil or emitted by the soil. And obviously when we talk about an entire forest, there's soil there. And that can be an important component of energy balance in a forest. Another important component is heat storage. There's enough biomass in a forest that the change in temperature of the biomass can influence the energy balance of that forest. When we think about forest canopies, the reflection coefficient is called something different. It's called the albedo. It means the same thing as the reflection coefficient of a leaf, but because it's basically composed of the leaves, but also branches and spaces between the trees, it's, it's called something else, and that's the albedo. And albedo varies in different systems. The albedo of sandy soil is relatively high, so about 35% of the shortwave radiation incident on sandy soil is reflected back. A surface like clay or most crop have a 0.25 albedo. Whereas most forest canopies, because they're very deep and complex, don't reflect much of the incoming radiation, so they have a relatively low albedo. One of the important considerations when people think about climate change is changes that might occur to the energy balance when we, for instance, take uh, an entire region that might be very sandy or be mostly crops and replace it by forests. That may drastically change the surface reflectance of large areas of the earth and could potentially therefore change the energy balance of the earth. Another term that's talked about when we think about forest canopies is the Bowen ratio. The Bowen ratio refers to the relative importance of those two main components of energy dissipation, convective heat loss and latent or evaporative heat loss. So it's just the ratio of those two. And I want to give an example where someone measured the Bowen ratio or the relative size of those two energy dissipation components in two very different forest types. So the first forest type that this study looked at was boreal jack pine. That's Pinus banksiana in uh, northern Canada. This is a photograph of this jack pine canopy. Jack pine is really sort of similar to our southern pines in that it tends to have pretty sparse canopies, low leaf area index, sort of scraggly looking. So you can see there's a, you can see a lot of soil there. These scientists compared the Bowen ratio in jack pine to that in a temperate deciduous forest. This is in Tennessee. So this is a mixed hardwood forest in Tennessee. Lots of different species, oak, hickory, maple, uh, very rich canopy, very dense much higher leaf area index than in the boreal jack pine forest. And these researchers used instruments installed in towers located above the forest canopies to measure energy balance components. And this is a picture of the tower and the instruments in that uh, mixed deciduous forest. This is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, near the Oak Ridge National. So let me show you an example of how they present this energy balance data. This graph shows for a period of one day, these are 
0 to 24 hours. The net radiation, so this is this circles are the radiation absorbed by the canopy. So this is the total in, in, input and then the outputs are latent or evaporative heat loss with the squares and this is H which refers to convective or latent heat loss in the triangles. Okay. So we can compare the relative uh, how radiation balance outputs work in the temperate deciduous forest versus the boreal jack pine forest. So let's compare. We have the temperate deciduous forest and the jack pine forest. We know that the leaf area index, we can just tell from the pictures, in the deciduous forest was high and in the jack pine forest was low. That high leaf area index forest is going to have a higher boundary layer resistance and the jack pine forest will have a lower boundary layer resistance. Because of those differences in boundary layer resistance, there will be differences in convective heat loss. Recall that convection is controlled by boundary layer resistance. So because that temperate deciduous forest has a high boundary layer resistance, it will have a low convective heat loss, which is indicated by H and the triangles on these graphs. And that's what we're seeing. Convective heat loss is relatively small in the temperate deciduous forest, whereas it's quite large in the boreal jack pine forest. So the opposite is true for the components that determine latent heat loss or evaporative heat loss. Stomatal resistance in the temperate deciduous forest is relatively low. Those stomata, stomata are wide open, whereas jack pine has high stomatal resistance. What that means is that transpiration rate or latent heat loss is quite high in the temperate deciduous forest and quite low in the coniferous jack pine forest. And we see that here again. Latent heat loss is relatively high here, relatively low here. So that means these forests differ in Bowen ratio. In the temperate deciduous forest, Convective heat loss is relatively small, latent heat loss is large, which means the Bowen ratio is low. And the opposite is true for the jack pine forest. This is roughly equivalent to the table we looked at for an individual conifer leaf or a needle leaf versus a broadleaf. Those different morphologies of the leaves and of the forests and their different physiology influence the relative importance of those two major energy balance loss components, convective heat loss and latent heat loss.